We're going to study, uh, take a look at Daniel 8, 9, and 10. Uh, but because, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, if we would have put the book of Daniel together, we would have put uh, Daniel 9 before uh, 8, like in terms of chronology. Um, so uh, I'm going to do that so that we can lay some foundation, and then we're going to take a look at Daniel 9 and then Daniel 10. So Daniel 9, you can... You can come with me to Daniel 9. Um, here we find one of the longest recorded prayers in the Bible. Daniel is praying. He also discovers the prophecy of 70 years of captivity. Uh, in, that he has been reading in Jeremiah. And uh, he discovered that Jerusalem would be desolate for 70 years. And... He's longing to see this rebuilt again. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, as he's praying, or we, we know that uh, we'll, we'll see that uh, the angel Gabriel is coming again. And uh, then I guess another prophecy. Uh, but before we go to the prophecy, I thought uh, that we can take a look at uh, the prayer first. So come with me to Daniel 9, and we will start to read uh, from the beginning here. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who made a king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books um, the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. You know, the people of Israel had broken God's covenant time after time after time. And we will also see a reflection of this through Daniel's prayer. And by the way, the word, the word covenant, uh, the Hebrew word for covenant here, uh, actually uh, means alliance or agreement. When, when this word covenant is used, it can also mean agreement or alliance. It's like kind of like a contract between God and His people. So like I said, God has always kept His covenant, but His people, unfortunately, has not. So, and this word, uh, covenant, uh, it's berith, berith. And this comes from the word bara, which means in the sense of cutting or to cut. In the sense of cutting or to cut. And this would remind them about the sacrificial system. It has the same root. So, you know, where they, they had to cut animals. They had, an animal had to die for their sins. And, uh, well, we use it also uh, in daily speaking. I've cut a good deal or cutting the cake. Um, so, in Daniel's prayers, we will see that he acknowledges the transgressions of the people of Israel, and he is crying out to God for help and acknowledging, we have broken your covenant. And um, we also know that, like I said earlier, the temple was destroyed in 587 um, B.C., so, Daniel is longing to see the temple rebuilt, the sanctuary. Uh, we see that also in verse 17, it's, it's desolate. Okay, so, verse 3. Then I set my, set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. You know, Notice what Daniel's doing here. Sackcloth and ashes was, was common during funerals. So Daniel will see here, he's dying to self. He's, he's, he, he, while he's coming to Lord in prayer, he's acknowledging the sins of Israel. And he's longing to see a change. Verse 4, and here we see, uh, it says, I, And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him, and with those who keep his commandments. Again, so we see here, you have kept your part of the covenant. We have not. 
that's basically what we see here and uh, like I said the purpose is here he's starting off with confession and then it goes on we have sinned and committed iniquity we have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments neither have we heeded your servants the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes to our fathers and all the people of the land O Lord righteous belongs righteousness belongs to you but to us shame of face as it is in this day to the men of Judah to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel those near and those far off in the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you the Lord to us again to us belongs shame to our kings to our princes and our fathers because we have sinned against you to the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness so he says to us belongs shame to you belongs mercy and forgiveness though we have rebelled against him so God is his only hope God is our only hope to us belongs shame to God belongs mercy and forgiveness so we have seen this as we have transgressed your law Romans 3 23 says all have sinned and lost the glory of God from verses 13 to 19 I will, as we read this I would like you to try to pay attention to the to the, to the two contrasts we see here even stronger we've seen it already a little taste of it to us belongs shame to you belong, belongs forgiveness and mercy and so in each verse from 13 to 19 you will well most of them you will see he's talking about us and what what he what or what about them and what the people of Israel have done and then what about God so try to notice as we read verse by verse it says from verse 13 as it is written in the law of Moses all this disaster has come upon us and we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth so basically we have messed up but God wants us to turn from sin verse 14 therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does though we have not obeyed his voice so again the Lord is righteous we have not obeyed him Verse 15, And now, O Lord, our God, brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. So God said, and made yourself a name, as it is this day. We have sinned, we have done wickedly. Contrast it again. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Okay, two verses more. Oh, oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. So let's take a short summary of Daniel's prayer, or from this uh, 13 to 19. We have messed up, God wants us to turn from sin. We have not obeyed, God's works are righteous. We have sinned, God's redemption uh, from Egypt. Uh, we and our fathers have sinned, God's righteousness. God's sanctuary, and then again, we are not worthy, God's great mercy. And then talking about God's forgiveness to his people. So, we see a great sense of humbleness here from Daniel. He's really longing for a great change uh, in his people, uh, in himself, so that they can get 
out of the captivity and rebuild Jerusalem. He has discovered a prophecy and knows it's soon supposed, uh, supposed to, to finish. And he really wants to get out of this situation that he's in. And <clears throat> a quite uh, an interesting remark here. Uh, I read in uh, Second Chronicles a similar thing, actually. I mean, it's like Daniel must have read this and gotten inspired and, and felt like he wanted to pray the same. Second Chronicles 6, 37-39. I won't read the, the whole thing, but and here's also a prayer uh, by, I think, it's Solomon, if I remember correctly. And there's also a long prayer. And this prayer, it says in verse 37, We have sinned, we have done wrong, and have committed wickedness. And uh, then again, it's the focus that God, well, God will hear from heaven, you know, and by, by humbling like this. And notice verse 38. This is, this is very interesting. And when they return to you, with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, where they have been carried captive and pray toward the land which you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and toward the temple which I have built for your name. I mean, it's like, almost like talking about Daniel's situation here. Uh, he's praying the same thing, and then it says here in prayer, you know, when they turn to your land, turn to your city, uh, uh, from where they have been taken captive and pray, and then basically... You will hear from heaven, verse 39. Forgive your people. So, it's almost describing this situation that Daniel's in. I've, I found it very interesting when I found it. It's just like Daniel has been reading this in the scars. Wow, or at least he seems to know about it. Quite interesting. Abraham Lincoln, uh, during the Civil War, he, um, well... Once there was a, a large number of people outside where he was, and they were waiting, they wanted to talk all, they wanted all to talk with the president. And then uh, one little boy is running there, uh, like to the front, passing the line, and then by the door, uh, they asked, what, uh, what's your name? And immediately when they heard his name, they let him in. He got to pass in front of all the line of people that wanted to talk to the president. And you know what his name was? Todd Lincoln. He was his son. So, uh, at least, this is, this is how it is with us, with God, uh, for us with God. You know, when, when we use the name of Jesus in prayer, we can come before the Father. It brings us right before Him. And uh, if we have the right relationship with Him, there is a lot of power and strength to pray in Jesus' name. Daniel prayed in the spirit of Jesus. And we, we discovered earlier that he prayed toward the sanctuary and by faith uh, he could behold the lamb that was going to be slain. So, now it has passed by around 13 years since uh, the prophecy in Daniel 8 was, give, uh, was given. And... Uh, Daniel did not understand it, remember? Oh, well, we haven't talked about it, but I guess you have read it before. He didn't understand it, and I'm sure he longed for, for understanding of all this. He was very perplexed when he, when he heard it, and he fainted. Um, so let's now take a look at the prophecy. So Daniel 9, 20-23. So I would, some of you would like to... To read uh, verse, yeah, start with verse 20 to 21. Uh, 11, would, you like, would you like to read? Or someone has? Yeah, I'm just trying to fix. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. Okay, thank you. So, who's coming here? Gabriel, right? 
Gabriel that had come to him in, in chapter 8. And uh, what vision is it referred to here in verse 21? Whom, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning. What can it be? We have not seen any vision here. So, the logical must refer to the previous vision he had that we know in chapter 8. Um, which we will go to later. But So, first of all, does God answer prayers? We see here that, you know, Daniel has been praying, and we have to understand, we have seen that he has been, you know, he's so sorry for the the sins of, of God's people and really sincerely asks for forgiveness on behalf of the people. And now Gabriel comes with a message to him, and we will see that this highly will fit also uh, with Daniel's prayer. So verse 22, And informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. In in chapter 8, it was a part of the vision he did not understand. And now Gabriel says, Now I will give you skill to understand. Verse 23, At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So, it's a nice message to hear. You are loved. I have come to help you. I have come to give you understanding again. Understand the vision. So, in Hebrew, we have two, uh, primarily two words uh, for vision. They have mara which refers to uh, appearance of a person. And then you have uh, kason, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing them exactly correctly, but anyhow, this goes more for symbolic visions containing animals and their actions. And um, in, if we go back to chapter 8 a little bit, chapter 8 verse 13, because in, in this vision... The question comes in the middle there, how long will the vision be? Concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And 14, he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And verse 26, the vision, let's see if we have it, okay, the vision, and here it talks about Mara. Uh, which is the appearance uh, of people or a person, uh, the vision, more of the evenings and mornings, which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, Kason, for it refers to many days in the future, about uh, different kingdoms here. And uh, verse 17 says the vision refers to the end time. So, it doesn't seem like Mare was, the vision, Mare was, uh, exp- uh, fully explain about the evenings and the mornings. Verse 27 is, is saying, is talking about, uh, well, Daniel. He says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for the days. Afterward I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision. And which vision do you think he was astonished by? Which one of the Hebrew words do you think? Mara, referring to the appearance of a person in a vision. Or regarding the animals, the beasts. beasts. It's actually the first one, and which which then and which was used of the evenings and the mornings. This is the one uh, that he was astonished by, and no one understood it. So the evenings and the morning, the two thousand three hundred days, no one understood it. He was astonished by it, and now in chapter nine, the angel has come to give him understanding of the vision. So he did not give an ex- get an explanation on this part, but uh, rather regarding the kingdoms, he got an explanation. And Daniel 9.23, what word do you think is used here regarding the vision? Of these two words, Mare or Kason? 
the first one referring to the evenings and the mornings. In Daniel 8, the, the last one talking about the beasts, the different kingdoms. Anyone? It's Mara. This is the vision that he's talking about in Daniel 9, 23. And uh, the next w- verse, uh, verse 24, will make it clear. Verse 24, Daniel 9. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And uh, if we go to the root of the word determined in Hebrew, uh, it means cut off. And that's very important uh, for this study. Shatak. Cut off. Seventy weeks are cut off. Cut off from what? I mean, if... So, if you see this in light with what we saw now, I mean, it, a Gabriel is talking about the vision that he will help Daniel to understand, and then, and then this word comes in also, it's cut off. Well, it's cut off from the, the other vision, 2,300 days. And here we have, we have 70 weeks, 490 days, which is cut off from 2,300 days days okay let's continue to finish transgression to make an end of sins to make reconciliation for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and prophecy and to account uh, sorry and to anoint the most holy okay and this word shatak which means cut off is only used here in the whole bible only here so, 70 times uh, 7, let's see, 70 times 7, 490, and we have 490 days, 490 years, we apply the day year principle here, um, because uh, this is highly connected with Daniel 8, uh, dealing with lots of symbols. And we have, like we discovered earlier, apocalyptic prophecies are uh, usually symbolic in nature. And uh, you usually have the smaller periods of time there uh, where we are are to apply the the Dayer principle. And usually it's an outline of time during kingdoms rising and falling. So, therefore we have to apply that here. And... um, what was this 70 week uh, prophecy requesting? What was the request for the people, for Daniel's people? There were uh, a few important things there. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish what? Transgression to make an end of sins. So basically, repentance, you know, come back, reconciliation. Repentance. And also, in the end of the verse, what does it say there? The second very important thing. Anoint the most holy. Okay, good. So, when does he start? Verse 25. Uh, Someone would like to read verse 25? We'll see when we get the start of this prophecy. Okay, please. Now, therefore, I understand that from the one part of the common to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, Messiah the prince there, there shall be seven weeks and sixty and sixty two weeks the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times okay thank you so from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem this is the beginning until Messiah the Prince is going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks. So, from the time when the command goes out, the decree comes out to restore and build Jerusalem, that's our starting point for this whole prophecy. And uh, some people are saying, uh, even though there, are, there doesn't seem to be very good historical uh, proof for that, but some people say that the seven weeks, the reason why it's divided up like this, because we see that in the, in the end there, the street shall be built again and the wall 
even in troubles of time, so some people are replying this, that it took exactly 49 years, seven weeks, to rebuild Jerusalem. But uh, it doesn't seem uh, several, well, I read, uh, uh, yeah, some scholars are saying that there are not, there are not good enough proof for that, but others are saying, look, that's what happened. So I'm just telling you so you know. But either way, that's not the important thing about this prophecy. Uh, the important thing is that it was built again, and uh, that the command, uh, or the starting point, was, was when the command went out. Okay, so, uh, in order to find out the year, we need to go to see when the decree was given. And there were actually three decrees given in the book of Isra, because this is where you find it. And it's good to know, because if not, it can be quite confusing. Um, in Israel, chapter 1, Cyrus came, came with a decree to rebuild the temple. To rebuild the temple. And uh, our, pro our prophecy here says Jerusalem. So this is only part of Jerusalem. It's not the whole. And then in Israel 6, Darius, he came with an authorization to carry out this decree. You see, Darius... It seems like he was already uh, in Babylon when Cyrus came and, and took it over. Uh, at least, and he, because Cyrus and Darius, they were both ruling uh, at the same time. Both were called kings, but it seems like Darius was was kind of a kind of like a governor or something. He he had he had his dominion, but Cyrus was kind of seems to be over him for the whole kingdom of, of Medes and Pers Persians. Uh, because I, I myself was a little bit confused when I read Daniel and saw these different references, Cyrus, or Cyrus and then Darius, and I thought, who was first? You know, uh, but that's, uh, that's how it seems to be, uh, that they have been ruling at the same times, and uh, yeah, with, but Darius was kind of the first one and that Daniel would go to, I mean, if it was regarding the kingdom. Okay. Anyhow, and then we have the third one, Artaxerxes, and this is the decree to build uh, Jerusalem. So it was kind of like two exoduses out of, of Babylon. Uh, and the first one, some of the people, some of the captives who were allowed to go and start rebuilding the temple. And then uh, when Artaxerxes came with a decree, and we're, let's, let's go there and read it in Israel chapter 7. And we will read from verse 7. So, Isra 7, verse 7. And it says there, And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethinims, unto Jerusalem, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the king. And 13, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. So in the seventh year, this command went out. And then in order to find out this, uh, of course, we need to know when the right or Artaxerxes started his rule, and he started in 464 BC. 464, uh, but he actually started a little bit earlier because it was very common to have a so-called ascension year. In other words, when you took over uh, at this time in the fifth century BC, uh, the Jewish calendar were from, were from was from fall to fall. Uh, so the question was asked uh, earlier uh, from our brothers in Kenya regarding this, uh, how you're counting, you know, if you take in, in, in account uh, the time from there, yes. So fall to fall, and in this case, but it has been changed during years, uh, so, but during the 5th century from fall to fall. So Artaxerxes, his dad, Xerxes, he died in December of uh, 465 before Christ, and uh, so it seems then that, well, 
Artaxerxes took over, uh, there are good sources that the, the, this news reached Egypt early in January about the death of Xerxes. So he had first his ascension year until he started from the fall 464 BC. So then his seventh must be 455 BC. Do you get what I'm trying to, to share or is it confusing? The ascension year, let me take it again. Uh, do you get the point with the ascension year? This was common uh, for the kings. I mean, the next king that would take over. He would remain the rest, uh, the rest of the part of the year. So this would be kind of zero. Um, so he started rule 464 BC after his ascension year. This is the where you start counting. His so first year. year means taking the crown year somehow. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so when his dad died, he reigned the remaining year. Mm -hmm. And then you start counting from the next fall, mm -hmm. which the Jewish calendar was at this time. Uh, from, from fall to fall. That's when their years were in the 5th century. Any questions on this so far? It can be a little bit, uh, you know, a lot of numbers. And, and uh, at least for me, I, I need to sit down by myself and think, and okay, here's the number. So it can be a little bit overwhelming if you, ha if you haven't seen this in a while and maybe it will be confusing. But if you, we have this year, 464 BC, uh, his seventh year uh, would then be uh, 457. Is it good so far or do you have any questions? Yes. Yes. How do you know that um, the seven years, so after his ascension one year later, to count that seven years? That, that, that year was a start. Um, here's a quote from William Shea, Bible Research Institute, uh, regarding it's, it's an article called When Did the Se Seventh Weeks uh, of Daniel 9, 24 Begin? If Israel began Artaxerxes' years according to the Jewish civil year, then the first year began in the fall of 464. A king's first reignal year began on the system's New Year's Day. The period between the moment when a king died and a new king officially came to the throne of his first New Year's Day was known as the Ascension Year. In Isra and Nehemiah, we are dealing with reignal years only. Okay, so uh, did, it, did it make it more clear? No. No? Okay, so what Because I understand that he started in 464 mm -hmm. and then one year later, 463, yeah. it was here... His year yeah. of ascension, so he started... No, no, oh, sorry, sorry, okay, so he started his year of ascension. Uh, this, this is his first official year of rule. His year of ascension started 465 oh, okay. in, the, in the end of December. All right. So that's his first uh, ascension year until here. So this is his first real year that is counted as rain. Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay, okay, now I understand. Okay. I still don't understand... Where do we get that seven years later, it starts the... Oh, yeah, because we read it in Isra. It said in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I... Yeah. So, uh, that's why we do the seven. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, here are some other references for this year. You know, I, I like to look up uh, the facts regarding the years and so on, because... Sometimes in history, they are not counting these ascension years, and then it will get a little bit wrong. So you may, when you look for dates regarding this, you know, regarding when we, uh, the next date we'll, we will find, regarding uh, Christ's death and so on, uh, some, some sources say in different numbers. So it can be good to know these things. And here are other references for this year. The Greek, Greek uh, Olympia dates, uh, Ptolemy's canon, the elephantine papyri, as well as cuneiform form tablets. So there are several sources that, are, that uh, would be in, in line with this year. When I look back to my life, uh, I am glad I did not know all what, what would take place, uh, what would happen, you know, for, that I would become a nurse. That would be something I wouldn't like to know earlier. Uh, that I would have, uh, fight certain diseases, that I would be in accidents, that I would be in a prison like here, uh, <laughs> that I would be stuck at more than 2,000 meters elevation in the Pyrenees of Spain. And, uh, you know, things like this. If we have time before I leave, uh, I could share you some from this uh, prison store in Israel. 
quite weird. Here I, here I am in a prison car and on my way to the door of the airplane. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a long story, so I won't say we I don't have time to share it now. And of course, they didn't accuse me for something, even though they were suspicious. Um, they didn't allow me into the country. Uh, that was the reason, and then they put me to this prison until I would be sent back. But uh, it was it was scary in a sense. I mean, they were they were not very nice with me. I lost three kilos in three days. Didn't get so much food. Um, didn't get to take my medicines. They didn't, they didn't they took away all my stuff and yeah. So it was quite horrible. But uh, the point is, you know, God hears prayers and He shows us. His will in the right time. Daniel, he was confused about this, what he heard in Daniel 8 regarding the, the evenings in the morning. He fainted. He, was, he really couldn't understand. He, he thought it sound hor sounded horrible and he wanted an answer. And God didn't show, show him that at that time for a reason. Uh, he waited. And we, see, we have seen this in prophecy. He doesn't share all the details in time. And, and part of the book of Daniel is, was supposed to be sealed until the very end time. We'll get back to that a little bit later. But God shows his people gradually what will take place and also uh, when, when his people is ready to receive it. So, let's now take a look at the coming of Messiah uh, in, from verse 25. Verse 25 says, Now therefore understand that from the going forth, yeah, we have been starting reading it, um, from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall and in troublesome times. So, uh, 69 weeks until Messiah was to rise. That's our first date. And uh, if you take... Um, if you take 483 years... Here, which is 69 weeks, plus the year we are at now. And remember, we are not, we are not supposed to count the year zero. Then we get to 27 AD. I mean, you have to skip zero because it's not a year. I mean, you go from minus one to one. What happened in 27 AD? That's when it, the text says, until the Messiah, the Prince. What happened? His ministry on earth began. Yes, officially, yes. So let's go and take a look in Luke chapter 3 and see if we can find a date also through the Bible. Luke chapter 3, verse, uh, the beginning of verse, verse 1, we read here, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Here we have a reference point for what we will find. We have a reference point, uh, it's the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. All right, so if we, here's a quote from Edward Gibbon, our friend that we got to know a little bit yesterday, uh, which is an expert on the decline, or was an expert on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which has been writing a lot about. So he is saying this, Augustus, which was the previous Caesar, rested his last hopes on Tiberius, obtained for his adopted son the censorial and tribunitian power, powers and dictated a law by which the future prince, uh, Tiberius, was invested with an authority equal to his own over the provinces and the armies. So he's saying, look, he actually started ruling earlier. He started his reign before Augustus was dead. That's what he's saying. And... What actually happened is, uh, here's another quote from uh, William Shea in the book Daniel, that I also can recommend you, uh, William Shea, uh, Daniel. Two years before Augustus died, the Roman Senate voted Tiberius, co-ruler of the provinces, with his father Augustus. Such an arrangement is called a co-regency, um, as and is similar to the situation when King David put Solomon on the throne with him before his own death. So Augustus died in, a, in 14 AD. So Tiberius then must have started in 12 AD. Um, I know that 
I mean, there are there have been some different th uh, theories in how to find this date, uh, but this seems to be the most probable one for me uh, to to get the 27 AD. Um, some are using like your calendar and is uh, said that he only re ruled for one year and then get it to the same date. But either way, we will see that it fits with this year, and that's the point. It's very clear. So let's take a look in the same chapter, Luke tr chapter three. What would happen? Uh, verses 21 to 22. So, one of you could please read loud like a trumpet. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily, in bodily form, like a dove, upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. Okay, thank you. So, he got baptized, but here was talking about Messiah, which means the anointed one in Daniel. Um, here in Acts, we, we get an answer here, uh, a little bit, uh, well, uh, help. He says, that word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea, all began from Galilee. After a baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. So, he called his baptism an anointing, which fits with his name, Messiah, the anointed one. Okay, and what did Jesus say himself regarding his baptism? In uh, Luke 4, 18, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is right after, right? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. So he's, he's using this himself. And then he also says in verse 21, This day is this, uh, this, day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Which scripture is fulfilled? Daniel 9. The first date, 69 weeks. This is fulfilled. That's when he started officially his ministry. And uh, in Luke, um, Luke 3.23 says he was about 30 years of age. Of, year, of, of age. And uh, so we know, uh, an interesting detail is, if Jesus was 30 years old when he got baptized... Uh, in Israel, when a man turned 30, he was eligible to become a priest, to serve as a priest. That's when the priest started, when they were 30 years old. So uh, they were eligible for, for priesthood. So uh, that's quite interesting that Jesus also being 30, being, uh, starting his ministry, just as old as he would have to be in order to start being a priest. Uh, so, let's go back to Daniel 9, chapter, 20, uh, tw chapter 9, verse 26. It says, After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the, prince of the, uh, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And here is important that we uh, realize that here uh, we see a chiasm also through these verses. First talking about, we see Christ, then talking about Jerusalem. Christ, Jerusalem, it goes back and forth like this, it's a chiasm. So A, B, A, B, A, B. And because if we don't understand that, we may mess things up. Uh, but what, what, what he was talking about here was the destruction of Jerusalem that will happen after uh, after this prophecy uh, is done, or the 490 years. And in this verse we see Messiah destroyed and then sanctuary destroyed. Exactly when would Messiah be cut off, according to this text? The midst of the week. We see that in verse 27 that it says... Uh, in the middle of the week. Okay, let's see. So let's read verse 27. Alright, 
then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, and even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. He was to confirm a covenant for one week. So he started the last week when he was baptized. In the middle of the week, he died. Uh, what about uh, after? What about the end of the week? I mean, how could he confirm a covenant for one week if he died in the middle of it? Have you ever wondered that? What would you say? He worked for the apostles also. Exactly. Very good. How long was Jesus in ministry from when he started? Like we talked about earlier. Three and a half years, right? Uh, so, in Matthew 27, uh, what happened, this is when Jesus uh, was dying. Matthew 27, verse, verses 50 to 51, we read, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split so you know we have the sanctuary service pointing to Christ the Jews totally missed the event the big event the anti-type they kept looking looking to the type and uh, Christ was sent to restore his covenant that the Jews had broken that Daniel said you know we have broken it you have kept your part earlier in the prayer so, uh, as a symbol, this veil in the temple between the holy and most holy place were cut in two. As a sign that Christ died. He, he broke as well. Okay. Jesus' sacrifice through his death was predicted. The sanctuary service pointed on him, who is our only hope. How can Jesus confirm a covenant in one week if he died in the middle of the week? That was my question. Uh, here's a few verses on that. You know, Jesus said, don't go to the Gentiles now, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Jews still had three and a half years to repent. Start with them, Jesus is saying. Don't go to the Gentiles. And then Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 is talking about... Uh, um, Jesus, uh, Jesus is saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So just like, just like John the Baptist, uh, Jesus was preaching the same message. Repent. Daniel 9. The kingdom of God is at hand. Time is fulfilled. He's pointing back to Daniel 9. This is the time. So, how was the co uh, covenant confirmed? Hebrews... 2.3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? It was confirmed through the disciples. Jesus preached a message, repent, or John the Baptist started, and then when Jesus came, he preached, preached the same message, the time uh, is fulfilled. The time is that the kingdom of God is at hand. And then his disciples preach the same message. Repent, you know. You still have some chance. When Jesus died, uh, he went to heaven, uh, in, to the most holy place, as a priest, as a high priest. And he sent the Holy Spirit, like he had promised, to the disciples to finish the work. So they continued to confirm in the covenant that Jesus uh, came to establish. It was confirmed by those who were preaching the message. The 490 years was about to uh, finish. And did they succeed? Did most of God's people actually turn? Repent? No. Unfortunately, they didn't. And in Acts chapter 7, oh, we have it here. Uh, Acts chapter 7 from verses uh, 54 to 8 verse 4. Talking about Stephen, he's having his last sermon. Acts 7, from verse 54 and on. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. 
the people that listen, you know, Stephen was speaking to before Sanhedrin. And what do we know about Sanhedrin? Anyone of you know about the council? This is the this was the highest council of Israel. So Stephen was preaching to them, and they were cut to the heart. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at at the right hand of God. When they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him down out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then they knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, this, he fell asleep. And then he says the persecution started, a great persecution started against the church. They got scattered, but he says, like he says in verse 4, they keep, kept preaching the word. Uh, which, which year are we now? The end of the 490 years. 34 AD. 34. So three and a half years after uh, Jesus died. So, and Jesus said... This Peter asked, how many times should I forgive? And Jesus said, uh, um, I said, I say not unto you seven times, but seventy times seven. That's interesting, 490. It's like he's, he's uh, at least uh, symbolically speaking, referring to the prophecy which is talking about they had, like their time they had in order to repent and ask for forgiveness of their sins. Okay, so, what happened after 34 AD, and this is important to understand, there are, there are some references here, I will not take time to read all of them, but in Acts chapter 22, verses 20 to 21, uh, we read, And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, this is Paul, and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, talking about Jesus, Depart, for I will send you far hence unto the Gentiles. So they, it was a shift of change now. Now they were sent out to the Gentiles after their appointed time of 490 years to repent from their sins. And remember Peter with the, the sheet that came down from heaven, I think it's Acts 10, and... Uh, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And it was unclean animals. And Peter said, no, not so, Lord. Why should I eat this? You know, uh, this is unclean. And Jesus said, don't call unclean what I have called clean. And, and people are using this, you know, in other churches as proof that we can eat whatever we want. But we need to let the Bible explain itself. Later in the chapter, same in the end of the chapter, I believe it is, uh, he's saying, let's see if I can quickly find, huh? Where's 20, yeah, let's see. 28, yes. You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one, uh, one of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So this was God's way of telling uh, Peter, look, this, uh, you, now you have to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Now it is time. So this is what happened. Uh, with God's people. Now they took the gospel out to the more focused on Gentiles. Uh, so who are God's people after 30, 34 AD? A couple of texts there. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And it's Romans 2.29 says, He is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. So now it starts talking about spiritual Israel, spiritual Jews, um, which is now God's people. Um, so, what was the result of the, re- the rejection of the Jews? According to the prophecy also. What happened, like I said, in the chiasm we had talking about Christ and what was the B part? Destruction, destruction of, of Jerusalem and the temple, including the temple, yeah in 70 AD. That was the result. But could it have been avoided? 
Could it have been avoided? What did Jesus say in, in, in Matthew 24? He was talking about this. And Jesus said, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet, uh, by the Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. And let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And in Luke, uh, he's uh, saying, When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then you know that the desolation there always lie. So, the early Christians, they managed to flee, but the Jews that didn't believe in, in Jesus, they stayed and got crucified. And uh, Jerusalem was uh, crushed into pieces by the Romans. They were, tri- they, were, they were tired of the Jews that were, you know, the other false Christs were coming, that's what Jesus had, had, had been preaching about. And the, Jew- the Romans got so tired of the Jews that that's what happened. And remember, I told you yesterday a brief story uh, about uh, when I was in the, when I worked in the home nursing care, and I did a mistake, and I asked God for a second chance, and uh, the witnessing opportunity I had to share, uh, or uh, basically to tell this woman I wanted to pray for her, the thought that I got. And when I asked for a second chance, I got one. And uh, if I wouldn't, she would have died without us having this conversation that actually calmed her. So it can have great consequences when we choose not to listen to, to God. And, and like, uh, God had given Jews so many chances to repent, but they would not. God respects uh, us. This is in the emergency ward, by the way, where I worked for some time. So, uh, another point. Just like God called the Jews to repent, He calls us to repentance and to share the good news of Christ. So we are about to round off this session. Just um, a summary of what we are looked at, of, at now. As a result of Daniel's study of Jeremiah, Daniel prayed for a new covenant experience. In his mercy, God gave 490 years to Israel so they could clean up their mess. This time period was cut off. The 2,300-year prophecy that started in 457 B.C. and ended in 3. 40, 34 AD, when Stephen was stoned. Israel rejected Christ and was no longer God's people. Jesus died, rose to heaven, and sent the Holy Spirit to his true followers, who now took the message to the Gentiles. You know, the Jews were God's people, and like we read, when, they were, when Stephen was preaching, it cut them in the heart. Rather than looking, rather than looking to Jesus that was cut, off for the sake of the people who was crucified, who died for them. It, they, it cut them in the heart and they killed God's people. And um, they got so many reasons to accept Christ, but they did not. They had a sanctuary with, with, with symbolism, like I said, and, and all the, the services and things in the sanctuary pointed to Christ. And one simple thing was the lamb that they had to sacrifice. And then when John said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin on the world, people didn't believe it. Even though every, everyone could see there was something special with Jesus. There were so many prophecies. We saw that there are more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus. How could we miss it? We may think, Man, these guys must have been stupid. I mean, how could we miss that? But what about us? You know, they did not receive him. What about us? Which situation are we in now? The sanctuary is being cleansed right now. We are here. There are many prophecies about Christ's second coming and what's going to take place right before, and they are taking place now. So let's not make the same mistakes as the same mistake as the Jews. And that's why we need to study the prophecies. We need to know, and we need to preach. We need to preach, take the gospel to the world. So. Do you want to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes a second time and not do like the Jews? If so, our, our Christian lives needs to be more than, than knowledge. It needs to be genuine. It needs to be surrender, a life of surrender every day. So, who you would like to not do the same mistake as the Jews did and be ready when Jesus comes back? Amen. Let's pray. Thank <laughs> you.
Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this amazing prophecy that is giving us the date, the very date of the starting point of your ministry here on earth through Christ. And also, uh, also the year of, of, um, of your, your death, Lord. And um, Father, we see how great mistakes your people did during that time during a long time but father we also acknowledge that we as your people today have done many mistakes uh, we are not better than the Jews we have we have all sinned Lord and we want to humble ourselves before you like Daniel and acknowledge that we have not done what we should have so please forgive us father and I ask that you may give us your Holy Spirit in a greater measure and it's that we may be the generation that takes the gospel to the whole world. And that we may be the generation that will reflect your character. So that you can come back. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen.